Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 471, the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and we're enjoying the 12 days of the great feast of the year, Christmas. Yeah, which day is it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to fumble around and count. Okay, Gavin and I are in a joyous mood this Christmas season, and I just did a show with George. We got this show coming up here with Gavin, and we're going to have a lot of fun. I got to click over here to my show notes. Um, but Gavin, how are you doing this week? Oh, I'm doing very well, Kevin. One of the things people may not know about me is I'm in love with clocks. And, and so I go around secondhand bazaars and, and for £20 uh, can sometimes pick up an old clock that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. And But, but the, the trouble with that is, of course, some of the, <laughs> some of the reason that people don't want them is they don't work. Yeah, they don't work. <laughs> but or the I, chime I, is just so annoying. <laughs> oh, but that's another story. My yeah. children came. Day and, and said, Daddy, turn those clocks off. We can't sleep. Um, I have learned to oil them, and so they now have a gentler tick. But the really exciting thing is, I found a little clockmaker in Shrewsbury. It's just something Dickensian. He lives behind the prison, the old prison, in a back street where you can't park the car. I have to go on my motorbike. And in his basement, it's just full of clocks. Wow. And, and I took in my clock, which had, which had broken, and I, I just thought, you know, maybe this is something I can't afford. Uh, Anyway, he, he mended the clock, and then he said it will cost you £30. That's well, not too bad. That's okay. That's, yeah. that's, that's manageable. And yeah. so uh, it is a most beautiful clock. Perhaps I'll send you a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's put a picture of the clock up right now uh, so our viewers can see what you're talking about. And some will appreciate it and some say, that those just make noise. Yeah. I, and every time we record in your house, every 10 or 15 minutes, it, and it's not in any schedule that I know of. All the <laughs> clocks start to go off, and it's like working in a Disney film with Pinocchio's father. It's doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, it's like well, I, I am trying to get them all to to, to keep better time, but some good. of the, some of them are you know they they haven't ever been mended, and so they're a bit eccentric. And, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I was very excited to find this man and to, to realize that that um, some of my clocks can be repaired, and it, it it's within a manageable, reasonable sum of money. That's good. That's very good. Uh, sometimes our old hobbies are hard to, like my sister-in-law collects French teacups. Right. It's her thing. <laughs> she has glass cabinets in her house of all these French teacups. And yeah, clocks are so beautiful. They're like a choir. And when they go, each one of these clocks has its own personality and its mm -hmm. own and, it, and its own eccentricities and and on the hour particularly they all sing and it, it's 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 like a kind of i don't want to be too pious but it's like a it's, it's like a, a celebration we are we are supposed to pray several times a day and the nice thing about living in a house with clocks is when they all go off there's there's a there is a, a tintabulation to the lord <laughs> okay <laughs> So they didn't have this at Jesus' times when it was the sundial. Okay, I understand. Yeah. All right, let's move a little bit on to the news, uh, which will be silly news as well uh, in some of our other stories. The first one's hard. Uh, here in America, we have the, uh, the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights. One of those is the freedom of speech. Uh, you are allowed, as an American citizen, the freedom to speak. It doesn't necessarily apply to the freedom to be heard. Um, but nobody can stop you from going anywhere and saying something except for fire in uh, a theater or something like that. Um, more and more, some places are having hate speech laws, uh, and it's hate speech to offer biblical correction uh, to somebody's lifestyle and stuff like that. And we're seeing this more and more uh, here in America and Europe and other places where they're clamping down on what they call hate speech. Now, Hate speech can be pro-Jewish. Hate speech can be uh, what they call homophobic or transphobic or sexual phobic or, uh, you know, whatever, transmitted sexual disease phobic. And uh, it's kind of interesting to see the different trends and how they're trying to shut down speech. Now, in your country, you don't have freedom of speech. You kind of have a, a two-part law. Uh, and Canada doesn't have freedom of speech. 
Uh, I, France certainly doesn't have freedom of speech. Well, I think I think what you mean, Kat, we have the practice and the and the background of freedom mm -hmm. of speech, but we don't have it uh, legislated for explicitly uh, as you do. And after your experience, I say your, after the experience of the of uh, the American settlers at the hands of the English regime, uh, you can see why they would want to. Sure. There, there, are, there are three there are three areas where, as Christians, we we need freedom. One is freedom of speech. The other is freedom of the internet or, mm. or the press, but they become synonymous. And the third is, is freedom to trade or to, to give and receive money. Uh, one of the things we're finding is the slow but sure strangulation of our rights in all three areas. The thing that's been really surprising to me, and I, I, I hope that one of the things we can do in this program is to alert other people to it, is initially when I... I uh, found myself struggling for orthodoxy. I thought, well, this is just a matter of being faithful to the Lord. It's about one's relationship with Jesus, uh, one's understanding of the power and the authority of the New Testament, one's reading of church history as, um, as, as the goodness of the church provokes evil in the world, mm -hmm. quench it. But one of the things I didn't realize was the, the rapidity of the way times were changing uh, in our own lifetime. And so simply over the last five years, the changes have been enormous. And although a number of us said, well, look, we need to be careful because these forces that are arranged against us, embryonically and potentially, they are the forces uh, of repression. Uh, they, they pretend to be progressive, but they are in fact, uh, um, uh, they, are, they are going to close us down. No, I couldn't have imagined within the speed that they've taken place that our capacity to speak out in the public place has been uh, circumscribed. On the internet now, the terms and conditions by which you use YouTube or any of the social media are explicitly pitched to in favor of the progressive agenda. And now one of the frightening things that's happened is it's happening to money too. Mm -hmm. so I was listening to Jordan Peterson. I'm a great fan of his. He's, he's nearly a Christian. Uh, talk about the way in which Patreon has thrown off a well, I think the, the pronunciation is Patreon. Uh, a lot of people use that, so we want to be sure that they know we're talking about the same thing. You say tomato, I say tomato. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> For our American audience, Patreon. <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> I'll, I'll, if I, I'll just mess it up. No, no, no. Patreon is how we It's like a Patriot. Patreon. Somebody it's who, like a Patriot. Exactly. Okay. All right. It's a, if I, you know, if I say it's a patriotic thing to do, I shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> so Jordan, Jordan Peterson, who, who has been able to be independent, uh, as indeed I, I have too, because of the small, the number of small gifts that people have made, made to me, depends upon um, Patreon. And, uh, but very recently, a man called uh, Robert Spencer, who is in charge of Jihad Watch, so he's one of the very good guys telling the truth about uh, about Islam. He received an, an email from Patreon, and it's on it's on the internet. And I, we might put it up too if you think it's the right thing to do. So so Patreon are emailing Robert Spencer and saying, "Hey, we've been emailing with Robert today to explain the situation. Unfortunately, Mastercard required us to remove his account. We'll continue to email with him if he has further questions." And Robert Spencer, who's had the, the financial ground cut from under his feet because he's running Jihad Watch, says, uh, OK, Patreon, be honest, please. You haven't been emailing with me. Um, my eyes are going. You sent me one email saying that MasterCard wouldn't work with me, which is weird since I don't have a MasterCard. No explanation was offered when I asked for one. You don't give one. Now, this, of course, is, is a sign that the progressive forces of of Patreon, uh, like Facebook, uh, like Twitter, are beginning to crack down on those who don't share the progressive agenda. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that Jordan Peterson was saying is he's looking at the forces behind this, and there's one particular one called Change the Terms. And they, they, they're attempting to bring pressure on financial institutions and the media, too, to change the terms of use, to make them even harder for people who don't explicitly support the agenda of LGBTQIA in their case. What this is doing is it, it, it is moving more and more frighteningly close to Revelation chapter 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you don't have it just like that? <laughs> <laughs> Revelation 13, 16, and 17, if memory uh, serves correctly. So, uh, and, and, and it says, uh, it also causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, people have been wondering whether <laughs> barcodes uh, or, or chips will be the way in which this is done. But but we have, for the first time in my lifetime, got to the point where Ideology. you might not be able to trade, yeah. buy or sell, if you don't wear the mark of the beast. In other words, in our case, if you don't subscribe to progressive values. Well, one of the, this really ought to be another form of wake-up call to those who don't see that not only are we keeping the Orthodox faith because we're following Jesus and sticking to what he meant and he intended, but that the progressive part of the church is serving this other malign force as it aligns itself with the ideological uh, ideological uh, basis that, uh, that, 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 that this anti-God movement is basing itself on. Now, people say, oh, come on, it's just a, it, how, how bad could Patreon be? Well, let me show you an example of the Second Amendment. Uh, the NRA, who operates out of here, here in New York City, uh, in New York, uh, got a call from their bank uh, last November, maybe October, saying, we can't do business with you anymore. We're going to close all your accounts, all the millions of dollars you're going to have to transfer to another bank. And they're like, Why? Governor Cuomo, the governor, governor here of New York, called us and said that we're going to be audited if we don't drop you. And furthermore, this listed all the threats that uh, this bank would go through if they didn't uh, drop the NRA. And then FedEx called a week later and said, listen, we can't ship for you anymore uh, in your packages. And they said, why? The government says that we will lose our government contracts if we continue to do business with the NRA, guilty by association. Right. And this had an amazing quick effect with the NRA, left scrambling to find a bank that was registered and licensed within uh, the state of New York. Uh, these things have effect. And Patreon has dropped several conservative bloggers and people who have a financial income through their YouTube channels, through their websites, through their Facebook accounts, through their Twitter, Twitter accounts. And it's a way to cut off and take from the marketplace people who have an ideology or a belief uh, or are Christians. And it's amazing to see this type of influence that wasn't available uh, to the progressives 20, 25 years ago. This is something brand new and they're very good at it. And change the terms is going to really be hard on places. Well, it won't be hard on us because we just collect donations. But if you're going to want to have a business that operates on the Internet and you want patronages uh, to help fund that, you need to be liberal or progressive. Kevin, it will be hard on us mm -hmm. uh, without being hysterical or neurotic or, or over eschatological. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it's a very short step from Patreon to PayPal. Mm -hmm. It's a very short step from PayPal to Visa. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why these pressures shouldn't be extended. Um, th I mean, one of the things that, that Peterson was saying, for example, was that there are uh, that some of the progressives are saying, well, why should the conservatives have access to our social immunities? Why should they be allowed to drive on highways? Now, in both the Soviet Union and in China, one of the first things that the regressive Marxist government did was to withdraw from Christians access to education, to health, to social amenities. We really, we've been here before. The surprise is that the, re the regressive uh, forces of, of Marxism, which uh, have been alive and well in the Soviet Union and China, are suddenly coming through the marketplace in America and Europe. And in a way that, as far as I can see, no one at the moment can stop them. So Peterson and his friends are saying, well, let's find an alternative way of doing this. I hope they manage, but our very access to the internet, although it seems at the moment that um, we're safe and sound, if things are changing at this speed, we may not find ourselves so safe and sound as we hoped. I may not meet the terms and conditions in the future of Optimum Online, my ISP that provides access for all my servers and uh, this show and other things. And absolutely agreed. Um, if you don't want 
an alternative voice in your space, you just shut it off. And they found a way to do that despite the laws of freedom of speech. Um, let's do some transitioning here. Uh, and up front, I'm going to be here. My bias. I am a fan of GAFCON. I'm a fan of the ACNA and all that. But I've read a, a letter today from the chairperson who was put out today. Is it from the chairperson? It is, yes. Chairman's uh, epiphany yeah. letter. That to me, in my humble opinion, seemed a little underwhelming considering the conditions of the age. Now let's do a little quick history. Back in 2003, uh, the Episcopal Church decided that they were going to consecrate Gene Robinson, who was a practicing homosexual in a gay relationship, to be a bishop in the Episcopal Church. The rest of the communion freaked out. We got letters from almost every primate saying, don't do this. We had Drexel Gomez saying, this will cause a tear in the fabric of the communion that will probably never be uh, uh, repaired. And it wasn't, or isn't so far. And the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church in Canada were known as the progressive uh, provinces in this church. In the last five, ten years, and some people you know, say 20 years, uh, the Church of England has done a wonderful job of being very progressives themselves, and in my humble opinion, are leading the progressive charge, especially with like transgender, transgendered baptisms. We don't have that in tech. Okay. We don't have that in Canada. Uh, the, use, the use of baptism to uh, articulate the new gender identity for a transgender person. So the GAFCON letter today kind of called, said, you know, uh, this is making it hard to have a relationship with Canterbury and the Sea of Canterbury. We kind of hope that they will repent. This is such a different response than 2003, Gavin. It is. Well, let, let's read it. As I read this, I thought, oh, good. Hooray. They, they've woken up to the fact that this really matters. <laughs> well, um, if you want to read it, go for it. One more step. They'll do something. And so, uh, so the chairman says... Um, Okay, the uh, Lambeth 110 didn't directly address gender transition, but nonetheless, this is part of the way in which revisionist provinces are moving their, ethic, their ethics onward. And then he says, so, you know, we're glad for the Sea of Canterbury. We can't avoid the sad truth that insistence on full communion with Canterbury now risks jeopardizing the apostolic faith itself. Well, wait a minute, there is no risk. <laughs> it's doing it. That way he, he goes on to say, let us pray there will be repentance and that God will give courage and boldness to, the, to those uh, who remain faithful. Well, it's too little, too late. Mm, uh, that, indeed. Tech hasn't repented. Canada hasn't repented. Archbishop Welby uh, so far hasn't repented. By all means, pray for him. But at the same time, we need to use our common sense. This is not... This is not a movement where people are in two minds and they have a guilty conscience pricking them that, that they're not getting it right. They're absolutely convinced this is the gospel. And they also, they're quite convinced that those who don't believe it's the gospel, like you and me, uh, are, are nasty, chauvinist, homophobic, sick-minded en enemies who need to be held at bay. Now, if, if there are a few miracles, one took place in my life, hooray, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's great, but there's no likelihood of institutional repentance. And the question is just to say this risks the apostolic faith. Let's let's hope they think better of it. I'm afraid this is this is underwhelming, and I it's, it's getting close to being a dereliction of duty. Okay, Gafcon, let's do. I, I, you listen to the program, and I I appreciate it. Thank you. I am a fan. You are, hopefully, the future of the Anglican Communion. The Sea of Canterbury is no longer the future or participant in the Anglican Communion. Uh, the ACC is no longer a participant or the future of the Anglican Com Communion. Okay, the Church of England and the House of Bishops are no longer part of the future of the Anglican Communion. They've chosen a different path. Call for their repentance. Don't just ask for it. If they don't, we need to move on without them. And this, you know, this should have been a great press release for the AMIA. Uh, I think, is that I think an Kevin, English in England? Sorry, AMIE. My my apologies, there. Uh, not kind of a, a Driswald. Well, we hope they repent. But I think one of the things I'd like to see in the Anglican Communion, that is the Orthodox part of it, mm -hmm. is the realization that across the world, what we have been fighting as heterodoxy 
is turning out to have a spiritual malignity that is coming against freedom of speech and freedom of action, that is, that is, that is rooted in being anti-Christ, but is actually pragmatically destroying the society and the freedoms of society we live in. So this, this, looks, this started off by being a, a matter of orthodoxy versus heterodoxy. But, but as so often, the heterodoxy turns out to have a really serious sting in the tail. You would hope that the Anglican Communion worldwide would wake up and say, my goodness, is freedom of speech being eroded in democratic societies where we need freedom of speech to be able to preach the gospel? Well, we'd better do something about it. We'd better join together and become more energetic in its defense. And that inevitably means uh, uh, revisiting one's relationship with those parts of the Christian church that have put their weight, their authority, and their integrity behind a malign movement that appears, that is most certainly anti the New Testament and anti the teachings of Jesus. All right. We found it in Revelation. All right. <clears throat> Transition now. Now, this is a fun story because one of the things the Church of England has found uh, over the last dozen years, 20, 30, 40, maybe decades, is that people don't want to have Christian marriages anymore. And some bishop, some wise guy said, listen, I have a solution. And he's an entrepreneur, so don't laugh at him. But he decided we're going to have Kmart specials on our Christian marriage packages. So the Vicar of St. John the Baptist in Cheshire, Michael yeah. Smith, I'm yes. sure he's a very nice man. A nice guy. And an entrepreneur. He said to himself, I have a problem. How can I fix it? I know. Weddings are too expensive. Let's make it cheaper. Mind you, his, his view of cheap is a thousand pounds. And so he's having a competition. Uh, three lucky couples are being given the offer of having a wedding in his church for only a thousand pounds. Now, bless him. He's put together a team of volunteers. Um, flower ladies, photographers, uh, address alterations and so on. He's managed to persuade his bishop uh, to throw himself in as a kind of potluck special. <laughs> and and uh, they're, they're, the, the, the good news is they're hoping to make it easier for people who don't have money to get married. The bad news is um, this isn't the basis on which people should be lured in to inviting Christ to oversee their relationship and their wedding. This is more, this verge is very close to superstition and, and winning winning the religious lottery. And it, it's, so, you know, he's to be commended in terms of he's doing something yeah. and he's had a good idea. Um, but but actually, is this is this the secret to renewing the Church of England and its relationship with the pagan people that surround it? Probably not. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it, how is this different than three weddings in your funeral? Just a guy who wants to fill his churches for for the weddings and well, uh, more, more practically, Kevin, how is this different from the helter skelter in Norwich Cathedral? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I uh, hope you'll be able to put a picture of it uh, up. Please send me all the pictures I need for this episode because uh, uh, it's going to be a fun one. I mean, it's in the Church Times again, and there, there it is. You know, if you want to get people to Jesus. Uh, why not just promise them a good time? Because that's what Jesus went around doing in the Gospels. This is so much against what Christianity stands for. That that again, it's 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 both funny and sad. Um, the it's it's funny that people will go into a cathedral and whiz down one of these Victorian entertainment devices. But it's sad. It's almost as if they've given up saying. Um, you know, you are accountable to the God who made you and who will judge you. Um, and we can make a bridge between him and your conscience because Jesus died on the cross for you. Uh, but but offering people entertainment in a medieval building doesn't cut it. And if I memory serves, and this goes back 2,000 years, did not Christ complain about the stuff happening on the temple steps, on the temple mount, you know, all around the temple? Uh that was just like Helter Skelter. I, I, if memory serves, it's it's a long time ago. Well, Gavin, he, a great, I, yeah. You know, he just we, we know what he did. He 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 he, he took the ropes and he got rid of them. And this is not this is not what my father's house is about. And indeed, it isn't. No, Gavin. Another fun show. Uh, we'll see you Monday. We'll have a a a, a three time show with a, a George again. Uh, it's working out really well. That we're getting great numbers for watching the the three of us sit and talk about uh, uh, the communion internationally. 
and uh, George and I are covering North America, and Gavin and I get to t- cover Europe and England and that wonderful divided Church of England. Keep them in your prayers. Pray for the Sea of Canterbury. Pray that the House of Bishops does repent. Uh, pray that GAFCON realizes they are the leaders right now of the Anglican Communion, and so many people are looking to them for their leadership and to hold places like the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church in Canada, and, God forbid, the Church of England accountable. It's our role as Christians. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 471 on the 4th of January, which is part of the 12 days of Christmas. Thank you.